Okay, everybody, this is our series of lectures for this week on gender and sexuality. Uh, this is the first of three lectures. Um, this week we'll be talking about sex and gender. Then we'll be talking about core theories of sex and gender and gender and society. We'll round up this, uh, this portion of the lectures. So let's define these terms. So we use the term sex and gender in our common language to mean the same thing, just like we may sometimes misuse the terms race and ethnicity, but there is a um, dramatic difference between the two. Sex refers to an individual's membership in one of two biologically distinct categories, namely being male or female. That's how we typically think of sex. We think of your parts. Uh, it should be noted there are individuals who do not fall into either of these two categories. Uh, they are a minority of individuals, but we will discuss them, uh, I believe, in part three of this lecture. Uh, they're called intersex people. Gender, then, refers to the physical, behavioral, and personality traits that society considers normal for either male or female members. So... Um, we often talk of gender as being on a spectrum, with one side being extremely feminine and the other side being extremely masculine, and most of us fall somewhere in between there. Um, there are some gender scholars who say that we actually even move around uh, over the course of our day. So at one point, I could be, you know, screaming and yelling in a very macho masculine way watching a football game. And then it's possible within my personality, just me personally, to go then have to change a baby's diaper and then go make dinner and then, oh, drink a beer or two, right? And those all have kind of different gendered behaviors on them based on traditional roles. So then I jump back and forth on that spectrum. Uh, they sometimes call that doing gender. Most sociologists approach the study of gender from a social constructionist perspective. So they view gender as a social construct and acknowledge uh, the possibility that our traditional male-female categories are not the only way of classifying individuals. Um, and actually, there are many, many more ways to do it. Gender inequality refers to um, the treating of males and females as being different. Uh, almost always uh, it is men who have a greater amount of power than women. There have been societies where women have had a greater amount of power, but they're rarer. Um, there are several sociological theories that attempt to explain why uh, this inequality has persisted into uh, contemporary societies. Uh, sometimes we think of societies of the past as being far more male dominated we call that patriarchal um but in reality our society is also rather patriarchal um so let's talk about how the three core sociological theories talk about sex and gender functionalists believe that there are social roles that are that could be better suited uh, to one gender than the other, and the societies are more stable when certain tasks are fulfilled by the appropriate sex. Um, you may, and I uh, point this out with the black and white pictures, functionalists haven't really believed this for a while, and namely functionalists haven't really dealt with this topic in a while. Uh, most modern functionalists kind of stay away from gender, but the classic perspective is that if certain jobs are associated with men, other jobs are associated with women, then all of those jobs will get done and society functions as a whole. And uh, Talcott Parsons was a major um, functionalist to uh, deal with this topic. Again, Parsons uh, was doing most of his work in the 1950s. He stated that men uh, were, were more typically suited for the instrumental role in society. So the person who provides the family's material support and often serves as the authority figure, uh, your classic 1950s dad ideal. Um, and then they would argue women 
uh, be more suited for an expressive role, i.e. the person that provides the family with emotional and nurturing support. Keep in mind, obviously, these are incredibly dated um, perspectives and way of viewing it, but we can understand societies with these kind of very regimented gender roles by using this kind of theory, right? We can understand how the 1950s family structure operated, operated by using these ideas, and um, we can even apply this to modern families in maybe picking apart and dissecting what individual couples, which instrumental roles one person does, what instrumental roles other people do, and um, yeah. Conflict theorists then. Um, conf so functionalists aren't that great at talking about sex and gender, uh, and actually conflict theorists aren't that good at it either. <laughs> Um, conflict theorists believe men have historically had access to the most of society's material resources and privileges, and therefore, it is in the interest of men to maintain their dominant position. So, from a traditional conflict th theorist standpoint, um, men are in power, or anyone who's in power wants to maintain that power, and... Uh, they would do anything they could to continue that power. So the traditional conflict theorist would view traditional family dynamics in terms of a microcosm or a smaller scale version of uh, a factory with the father being the owner and the mother or children being workers. Now this is a rather clumsy model, uh, but it can be useful for getting at the um, the beginnings of what would be feminist theory, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Interactionist theory then emphasizes how the concept of gender is socially constructed, how it's maintained, and how it's reproduced in our everyday lives. Uh, the way we express gender, the way gender um, manifests is almost always through symbols. And this individual, we see a collection of uh, confused symbols, right? So uh, this man, he has a uh, rather pronounced uh, scruff, uh, maybe a five o'clock shadow. Uh, he has maybe a little bit of modest uh, lip stick or lip gloss on. I'm not really a makeup guy. Uh, he's applying uh, mascara, obviously. And these are not things, these are not symbols that match our traditional expectations. Um, and these are the symbols that we would look at. Let's talk a little bit more about gender in society. Um, gender role socialization is a lifelong process of learning to be masculine or feminine through our four main agents of socialization, namely family, schools, peers, in the media. These are our major agents of socialization. Uh, this is, um, this falls pretty well into um, our functionalist camp. Families are typically the primary source of socialization uh, for us when we learn our gender roles. Um, and actually social learning theory suggests that babies and children learn behaviors and meanings through social interaction and internalize them from expectations around them. Uh, this is relevant, this is important. If you ever plan on having kids or wanna understand kids, know that we teach little babies subconsciously to act like little girls or little boys from the very beginning. So if you wanna raise your child in a gender neutral kind of way, you have to start from the very, very beginning. Um, we say that we call little baby girls flirts, or we call um, little boys, oh, isn't he a tough guy? Well, um, if enough of that happens and they are aware of everything, uh, they will start to uh, take that on. Schools are also incredibly important for socializing gender, and 
children into gender roles. Uh, research has shown consistently that teachers treat boys and girls differently, and this may teach children that there are different expectations of them based on their sex. Uh, when we first started doing this research in the 1970s, uh, it was dramatic, uh, the difference between how teachers taught boys and girls. Um, it has lessened over time, largely because we've been able to teach teachers different ways of teaching. Um, but there is still a pronounced difference in the encouragement we give boys relating to uh, endeavors in math and science, and to a lesser degree, uh, the encouragement we give girls in uh, the arts. So continuing on with our life course, uh, in Western societies, peer groups are also a important agent of socialization, particularly in the teen years. And teens are rewarded by their peers when they conform to gender norms and they are stigmatized when they are not. You'll notice in this picture, the majority of those uh, young ladies are wearing lighter uh, colored clothing. Uh, you will notice uh, the males wearing very traditional darker colored clothing. Um, you will note that all of those pairs appear to be uh, heterosexual male-female couples. Um, the, this is the essence of conforming. And there are a lot of these uh, conforming rituals associated with the late teen years. And finally, there's no question that sex, sex role behavior is portrayed in a highly stereotypical manner in all forms of media. This includes television, movies, uh, magazines, as you see below. So not only do we see women portrayed in an unrealistic way, we see men being portrayed in an unrealistic way. Um, I guarantee you my stomach looks nothing like that, nor could it ever. Uh, we see a supposedly pregnant woman, uh, again, not really looking like most pregnant women look. Um, in books, uh, there are similar phenomena. In video games, uh, men are portrayed unrealistically. Women are portrayed especially unrealistically in most video games. Uh, and so on. Almost all of our media has this problem. Uh, so Barbie has been criticized by uh, feminist scholars almost from the very beginning, um, namely that her proportions are not that of a average woman, uh, as you would uh, see uh, here. Um, her, her head is strangely sized, which you could argue um, would have something to do with her being a doll, but her hips in particular and her legs and arms, uh, these proportions have been uh, scrutinized as possibly giving young girls um, some degree of body dysmorphia. Um, yeah, but this is really, this isn't that new. If you've ever looked into it, there's plenty to read on um, how unrealistic Barbie is. However, um, even Frozen which, um, if you are familiar, uh, is actually celebrated as being a relatively um, feminist, relatively uh, strong female story. Even in Frozen, we do see uh, elements of, uh, of bo unrealistic body issues. You would notice the males, um, I believe, uh, I can't remember their names, uh, Kristoff is the big one. Hans is the smaller one. Their bodies are relatively realistic, but you'll notice Anna and Elsa, um, Elsa being the one in blue, uh, their eyes, if you compare their eyes to their wrists, uh, their eyes are just as wide as their wrists. Uh, you could make an argument that that implies uh, weakness on behalf of the females. But again, that this is all stretching it just a little bit, but the arguments can be made. Uh, this is not just something among girls' uh, media. Uh, we see how this has changed over time with our superheroes. Um, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, our superheroes compared to today look kind of dumpy, right? Um, and, you know, I would feel relatively comfortable that if I were put in that outfit, I would look as good as Adam West, right? But 
um, even those those are plastic bolted muscles um, in the superheroes below. They are an unattainable um, body image for uh, most men. And uh, sex and gender impacts almost every significant aspect of our lives, just like race did, just like class did. Even lifespan is different based on sex. Um, I'll talk about this for a second. We see uh, in life course models that uh, men live uh, fewer years uh, on average than women. However, when you break, and that's pretty common knowledge, but when you break it down, you'll see that the mortality rate, the death rate of men skyrockets in the late teens into the 20s and then goes back down again once the male enters the 30s. It doesn't do that for females. And that is because during those years, us men are more prone to basically doing stupid things, to over drinking, to getting in fights, to driving too fast. And then if you look at the demographics, things even out again. So um, especially for younger generations with older generations where it was more common for men to smoke than women or for more common for men to work in construction than women, then that did stay a little bit higher uh, for uh, those older generations. But for those of us born um, after 1980, uh, this is the, the, the main gap is mainly in that 20s, late teens and 20s phase. So the lesson is, guys, if you want to live to survive, um, cut it out in your 20s. Um, don't, don't drink so much and all those other things. Women are disadvantaged in institutional settings in our society. Uh, women do tend to do a disproportionate amount of housework. In society, they also earn less on average than their male peers at work. Um, women, um, the common saying has been women earn uh, 75 cents to uh, the dollar that a man makes. Uh, that has been said for a long time. Uh, in the modern era, it's probably more like 80 cents to the dollar, but women do still earn uh, less than men do. And women are more likely to live in poverty. A uh, portion of that is because uh, when, uh, when family units break down, and men are more likely to leave and women are more likely uh, to stay with the children. And then that has a negative impact on finances. Uh, this, all of these has led to what's been called the feminization of poverty. Which is, an, which is an economic trend showing that women are more likely than men to live in poverty. Uh, these are caused by that gender gap in wages, uh, the higher proportion of single mothers compared to single fathers, and the increasing cost of child care. Uh, child care, excuse that garbage truck behind me. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, child care uh, can cost as much as a mortgage or, and it certainly can cost more than a rent in an apartment. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's the, I can tell you firsthand, it is the most expensive thing about raising a child. The second shift is a term that describes the unpaid housework and childcare often expected by a woman, even though she can completes a day of paid labor outside of the home. So this concept of the second shift really arose in the late 70s and 80s when most women, when, when some women decided to go off and get a job. Well, despite that those women went out to get a job, they were still expected to come home and do uh, most of the housework. And that continues to this day uh, in many family units. We even find studies show that unless and obviously this is applying to heterosexual couples. There's different dynamics in same-sex couples. Um, but studies have shown that unless the couple specifically dedicates themselves to being egalitarian in uh, the domestic workload, that 
men do t still tend to do less work housework uh, than women uh, but it can be counteracted if um, if there is a dedication to sharing the second shift the second shift doesn't go away um, it's just something that can be made more equal and please um, I have actually worked many jobs where there was a first shift second shift third shift uh, like uh, the second shift being a like 2 o'clock 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. job that's not what we're talking about it doesn't have anything to do with that we're talking about first your job that being one shift and then coming home that being your quote unquote second shift of work two shifts in one day if you will um, even our language and vocabulary tend to reflect hierarchical systems of gender equality inequality um, this is uh, easier to identify in other languages other than English, namely because we're not as familiar with those languages. Um, you see it uh, in Spanish, for example, uh, Latino being the uh, gender, uh, male gendered term for an entire group of people, but Latina meaning uh, people of Latino descent who are female, but if there is a group of uh, people of Latino descent and there's only one male in it, they're still called Latinos, but if that male leaves, it's uh, their Latinas all of a sudden. Um, and that's just one example from Spanish. Um, this is also present in, the, in our English language as well, um, especially in our swear words, right? Uh, if a female is called a bitch, she is nasty, she's mean. If a male is called a bitch, it's something very else or different, right? Uh, he's weak. Uh, he, um, yeah, it's, it's very much in our gendered language. And a lot of our most vicious um, insults uh, are related either to uh, sex or gender, uh, those sorts of things, uh, which uh, takes us into our next lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, and um, I'll, I hope you watch the next one soon.